Good morning. Will you please stand and worship with us today? For this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. Your feet, I 
I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my head lifted high. Oh, God. The battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Oh God, the battle belongs to you The battle really does belong to the Lord I'm back to my phone like we were at the beginning of the pandemic, sorry um, but the next song that we're talking, we're going to sing today is a new one It's called Son of Heaven And it talks about beholding God and when you think about that, um, I think about that veil being removed and we can see God with our hearts and our minds. Second Corinthians three seventeen through 18 says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God are being transformed in the same image of God. This is the word here in the flesh. Living among the meek and lowly, the voice of God is every breath, salvation of the world unfolding. Behold Him, behold Him, lift up your eyes. See the Son of Heaven, Hosanna, Hosanna, pour out your praise, sing the name of Jesus. This is His heart upon the cross and from his wounds his mercy is flowing and now the dawn put death to death and ever since the grave's been empty behold him behold him 
up your eyes, see the Son of Heaven. Hosanna, Hosanna, pour out your praise, sing the name of Jesus. Behold Him, behold Him, lift up your eyes, see the Son of Heaven. Hosanna, Hosanna, pour out your praise, sing the name of Jesus. This is his home here in our chest at every door our Savior's knocking. Oh, let him in, oh, let him out with every yes, his kingdom's coming. The sound of every saint. Rejoicing, oh Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Behold Him, behold Him. Lift up your eyes, see the Son of Heaven. Hosanna, Hosanna. Pour out your praise. Sing the name of Jesus. Behold Him, behold Him. Lift up your eyes, see the Son of Heaven. Hosanna, Hosanna. Pour out your praise. Sing the name of Jesus. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loud as grace. Teach me some melodious song. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone Oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter find my one Seal it, 
Seal it for the courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Just take a moment. Focus. Let the Lord speak to you. Let's just let this be a holy moment right now. Father, this morning we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for the way you're already stirring hearts and that you're already moving in our midst. Lord, may none of us leave this place today and be the same. May your spirit have freedom to work in and through us Chase out of us what you need to chase out of us, Lord. Put in us what we need from you. That we might walk and live in the freedom that you called us to. Lord, as we think, you redeemed us through your blood. You made every way possible for us to come into your presence today. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that we might know your presence, your love, your grace, your majesty, but Lord, also your friendship, your kindness, your compassion, your tenderness. Lord, would you come and woo us, even as you are at this very moment. Lord, use this message, these words, for your glory and your honor. Lord, accomplish your purpose today. Continue to put the enemy to flight in this place that all people here truly will be the temple of the living God temple of your presence. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Whew, that moved me. That's the evidence God is stirring in our midst, folks, when God starts stirring hearts. Isn't it awesome? You guys realize today could be the day that the sky rolls up like a scroll and Jesus actually comes back? Do you realize that? I mean, do you even have that in your mind this morning that today could be the day that everything changes for eternity? Because the King is coming. And you know, everything that He's called us to in this life is to live in that anticipation, that excitement, that possibility that maybe it's today. Maybe it's the day that my Lord will come back with all of His angels and all of His glory and will be called to Him. Can you even fathom what that will be like? Are you ready? You know, last week we spent time in Matthew 24 and part of Matthew 25 talking about the idea that no one knows the day or the hour when the Lord will come. But then we looked in 1 Thessalonians 5 and it says things like this, that, you know, those who aren't in Christ will be caught like a thief in the night. But not you. Not you if you're looking and ready because you've been rescued from the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. And because of that, he says, this day will not catch you like a thief. Are you ready? See, I believe there's a lot of people in the church today that are asleep in the light. Is it not true? We think that we're doing enough by just coming to church and saying a prayer over our meal and whatever, but we're really not caught by the love and the majesty of Christ. Can I challenge you today to think further and understand that there's nothing greater in all the world than living for Jesus. And I can testify to that truth because God has taken me to many different places in the world and I've seen and done things I never dreamed I would do. Why? Because Jesus saw this guy living in Newton, Iowa and said, I'm calling him to serve me. 
and he takes me on adventures and I'm always in over my head and God moves in great power and I've seen, I've seen God heal I've seen him deliver I've seen him set people free and, but the greatest miracle of all of them is people getting saved people's lives being transformed and Jesus is continuing as we walk to the, on this road to the cross as we're coming up on Good Friday you know it was good for us but really bad for him on this Good Friday, as we come to it, we're walking to the cross, and these are Jesus' kind of last words in the last week of his life. And he had some pretty strong things to say. If you remember last week, there were two men in the field. One was taken, one was left. Two women grinding at a mill. One was taken, one was left. And he challenges in there, if my servants are doing what they're supposed to, when I come, they'll be ready. But if they're not living for me, if they're living kind of like the world, when I come, I'm going to be what? Disappointed in them. In fact, he goes on to say they'll be cast out into outer darkness. So the question that comes to our head when we see things like that, does that mean I have to work my way to heaven? No, that's not what he's teaching at all. Salvation in no other name than Jesus Christ. But if you've been born again of the Spirit, something changes inside you and you begin to get a new view of the world. You can't help it if the Spirit of God is in you. If the Spirit has come upon you, you cannot stay the same. Can I just say that I believe sitting in the church across the land today, even in evangelical churches, I believe there's a lot of folks who have prayed the prayer but never been really transformed by the Spirit. Can I just tell you that the Spirit of God came, that we might have life, and that we might have the presence of Christ in everything that we do. He came to help us, to counsel us, to teach us, to correct us, and train us in righteousness. Are you experiencing that? Because Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? Everything we learned about the ten virgins last week, five were ready and five were not. They were all called virgins. They all went out to meet the groom. But five were ready and prepared, and as it went on, five had to go and get ready. Jesus came while they were getting ready. They weren't ready. Do you understand, like we talked about with Noah, that once the door is shut, it's shut. There's no more opportunity. My question is, why in the world would you want to take a chance of that door being shut? Now listen, today we're jumping into the parable of the talents. And we're also going to be looking at the judgment, the sheep and the goats, because they feed into each other. But I want you to understand, as we look at this parable, Jesus is saying some things that we need to take note of and understand so that we will be one who is about his business. Are you about the king's business today? Is he your life or is he just a part of your life? Do the things you do come because of your relationship with him or are you just inviting him to come along with what you're doing? There is a big difference. So Jesus says these words in a parable and understand he's getting ready to go to the cross, getting close. In verse 14 of 25, and I'm not having him put this up on the screen, so if you have your Bibles, turn there. It's just too much scripture to try to funnel through listen to what it says for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves or servants and entrusted his possessions to them to one he gave five talents to another two and to one another one and I love this he says each according to his own ability and he went on his journey and Jesus is literally saying I'm about ready to go on a journey John 14 he tells him I'm getting ready to go to my father and prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back to take you with me forever. But I'm entrusting upon you the kingdom, the gospel, everything that I'm about to do, I'm entrusting on you to use this for your glory. But one thing he teaches here that I think is very encouraging to me, because he talks about the different amounts, and a talent is a measure or an amount of money, but it's really not talking about money. It's an illustration that Jesus is using, meaning I'm leaving each one of you with a certain amount of ability. Different people have different capacities, different abilities. 
So he gives one five. That's somebody with high capacity, right? Like a Billy Graham. I can't compete with Billy Graham. But Billy Graham had a capacity for evangelism that goes way beyond some. Literally in Romans 12, it says each one is given a measure of faith, and they differ. People have different abilities, different giftedness, different capacities to do things. And so the one thing that's encouraging when I look at this, you're not all asked to look like and be like me, even though I'm going to say, follow me as I follow Jesus, right? And you're all going, whew, sure glad. We just look around. You're probably glad you're not, you don't have to be like anybody here. You've got to be yourself for God, right? You've got to live all out for Jesus yourself. But in that, each of us is given a certain ability, a capacity to serve the king, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And he gives five, he gives two, and he gives one. And so he comes back, and it says, those who, the one who received five went out immediately and put that money to work and gained five more. The one who got two went out and did the same thing, put it to work and gained two more. The one who had one said, oh, I'm, I'm afraid, and he went and buried his talent and hid it. So that when his master came back, he at least gave him back his talent. It's an interesting concept when you think about it, because listen to what he says. It goes on, it says, now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled counts with them. Do you understand that there's a day when God's going to settle accounts with you and you and me? There's a day when we will stand before the king of the universe and give an account for our life. What do you give an account for? Have you ever really thought about it? You're going to give account for what you did with Jesus, the gift of God. You're going to give an account for how you lived out your faith in this world. You're going to give an account for how you told people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And the one who of five kind of represents that person who, who went out and shared with everyone. The one who had two is a little more reserved, maybe not as gifted, but he shares, he multiplies. The one who has one reminds me of a lot of folks I know. They bury their gift because we don't talk about religion or politics. Think about it. Think about how many people really don't share their faith. And here's the one that really gets me, because I have people say this to me on a regular basis. Well, I just don't have the gift of evangelism. Do you know what, it's, you know what evangelism is, really? is sharing your story of God's grace in your life and forgiveness. That's true evangelism. True evangelism is testifying about what God has done in you, that you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, that you've put your faith in his work on the cross, his finished work, that his death, burial, and resurrection, that he conquered death in Hades, and that you know that you know that your sins have been wiped away because of what Jesus has done. That's what it means to share your faith. I want to talk about something that it's bothered me for years, and I've been mentioning this, but we live in a culture today, and I never thought it would happen in America, but think about how many places you're not supposed to talk about Jesus. Can't talk about him in the school, mm -mm, but we can talk about everything else, but not Jesus. Can't talk about him at work. Some workplaces let you know right away, you can't bring your faith in here. I'm so well, I can't help it. That is my life. How can you not bring your faith in here when you're a born-again child of God? You're a Christ follower, isn't it something, I have people literally tell me why well, I can't talk about Jesus there. I'm like, talk about him anyway. Share the truth anyway. If God's called you to that place, he's calling you to speak about his son. We, we hold the hope of the world in our hands. Why are we letting the world tell us what we can say and not say? Are you thinking about this at all? Why are we afraid of... Oh, I'll lose my job. Do you think God's not big enough if you stand up for him that he's not going to stand up for you? I mean, think about it. You'll never have to have him stand up for you if you never step out and need him to stand up for you. But if you're brave enough to say, no, I want to tell people about Jesus, I can't help it. I had that when I drove school bus. You can't talk about it. I not only talked about it, but I prayed over the whole bus yard every time, 80-some bus drivers. 
I prayed on my way out. They have all the cameras on me. And they watch the cameras. I'm like, well, I hope they watch this one. <laughs> you know, I pray every time. And I pray for my kids personally if they needed prayer. And I tell them about Jesus. Now, I wasn't belligerent about it. I wasn't pushy. I didn't force anybody to listen to me. I did it in a natural way, in conversation. But isn't God awesome? When you think about, do you think they, they tried to shut Jesus up? Isn't that what they said? Think about the apostles just for a moment. What did they say to them? Don't go and talk about Jesus anymore. And they whipped him and sent him off. And they said, we can't help but talk about Jesus Our anointing at the day of Pentecost was to testify. It was a separation of tongues that land on each person. They came out, what were they doing? They were proclaiming the gospel in a very dangerous culture. Because of that, 3,000 people got saved that day. But I look at this, and he talks to them, and they come, and he settles account. What does he say to them? And I love what he tells them. He goes on, and he says this. It says, immediately the one who received the five talents went and traded with them, and he got five more. And down here it says, when the master came back, in verse 20, it says, the one who received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. Listen to what Jesus says. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave or servant. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things enter into your master's joy. So then the one with the two talents comes and he does the same thing. So he gained two more. Ten to four. You know what Jesus said? The same exact blessing was upon the one who had doubled the two talents. You know the one that had one? If he would have either doubled it or had some investment there, he would have had the same blessing. Listen to what he says to the one. This is important. He goes on in verse 24, and it says, And the one also who had received the one talent came and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And he says, I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow, and I gather where I scattered no seed. And he says, Then you ought to have put your money in the bank, and on my arrival I would receive my money back with interest. But then he says this, Therefore take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does not have shall be taken away. Then he says to throw this worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is really an account of a person's life that he's talking about. And I think something that's fascinating, I don't know if you noticed, but Jesus didn't take the talents back. The one who had ten kept the ten, even though he brought them to the Lord. The one who had two kept the four, though he brought to the Lord. The one that was taken away from the one was given to the one who had the ten. Do you understand that God is asking us to do much with his son, with the good news of the gospel? And I want to read a passage that, to me, brings it out. And I don't know about you, but when I read verse 30, when it talks about the outer darkness and the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, I've had a vision of hell before. For over two hours one day I had a vision of hell. It was one of the most horrific things I've ever experienced, to be honest. And the reason it happened is because there was a guy in our community that I was leery of because of things that I've heard about him. I've told my girls to stay away from him. But I never personally tried to share Jesus with this man. We got home from vacation and found out he had died. And I sat in my chair and the Spirit of God came upon me and just began to talk to me about how wicked and evil and dark hell really is. That there's no exit. It's forever. There's no more chance. This is it. That was his chance. And I lived in his neighborhood. He lived just a few doors down from me. And I never, ever had compassion on that man because of the things that I heard. Instead of understanding that he was lost 
and he was depraved because of his lostness, I put the guy off. For two hours, God allowed me to experience and to understand the horror of a person who's outside of Christ. And I'm just telling you, that changed my life. Because I just don't know if we really believe it. I don't know if we're sitting here today and we really believe people are going to be cast out into outer darkness. Where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. I don't know if we believe it. Because I believe if we believed it, nothing could stop us from telling people. Nothing would stop you from figuring out ways to to talk to them about what God's doing in your life so that they might get hungry for what you have. Scripture calls us the salt and the light. And if we're salty enough, people get thirsty around us. Do you understand that concept? That when you're sharing, I'm not preaching at people, I just tell people what God's doing in me. What God's convicting me of. What God's rearranging in my life. And you know, it's amazing. People start going, I need that. I need what you're talking about. And then you get a chance to introduce them to the king. I mean, can you imagine? You know why God has a great big party in heaven? Every time somebody turns, because he so does not want them to be thrown into outer darkness. Jesus wouldn't have come and suffered all the horrific things that he suffered on the cross if he didn't passionately want everyone to come to him. He says he desires that none should perish. He wept over Jerusalem. How I long to gather you in. But they rejected him. And you know why he wept? Not because they rejected him. He wept because rejecting him means they reject being with him for eternity. It's forever. There's no exits. There's no way out. The Bible talks about it where the worm never dies where you never can quench your thirst. There'll be no rest, no peace, no love, no light. Can you just fathom that for just a second? So when I read passages like this and I end with, it ends like this, I'm just like, oh Lord, man, that should just make our skin crawl. That should do something inside us that causes us to go, oh Lord, I've got all these people. How many people do you know? Just let the Spirit begin to move in your heart about the people you know that don't have Jesus as their Lord and King. Think about this just for a moment. Tomorrow could be their last day. They could live to be 90. But you don't know. I've had so many people I've known through the years that have died suddenly. Things happen, and people that said, you know, I have a lot of time to change my life, and they died at 17. They didn't have any time to change their life. They got murdered. I've seen unbelievable things. And in Matthew chapter 16... Look at what it says here. You have your Bibles. Verse 24 and following, Jesus says some things that we have to understand. I'm not going to go into great detail with this first part because I'm going to end with that, but it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And it says, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Listen to what it says in verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will then repay every man according to his deeds. And it just pushes us right into the sheep and the goats passage here. Listen to what it says. I'm just going to read some of it and then talk about it. It says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. And so all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. He'll put his sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Do you realize on that day it's over? And it'll feel sudden, and it'll be like a thief to many. But when Jesus comes back in all his glory with all of his angels, can you just fathom that for a minute? Seeing the Lord come in all of his glory with all of his angels with him. In Revelation, it's interesting, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, it talks about the great white throne judgment. And I've spent time studying that and thinking about what this will be like, but in that throne, it says, earth and sky flee from his presence. Woo! I always love it when people say, when I get to heaven, I got a few questions to ask God. 
like God has to give an account. I'm like, sure you do. Good luck with that. He's going to have to explain to me, and I'm like, really? I said, I think you're going to go, oh God, have mercy on me. That's what I think you're going to do. Isn't it something, we have an arrogance sometimes, and I see it in our culture, and I see it sometimes in the church, and I've had people in my church literally say, he's got to get, tell me why, shaking their fist at God, and I'm like, excuse me, I'm going to move over here. Good luck. I hope it goes well for you. And I could tell you stories of things that happened to people that I've known that have done that. And everybody's like, oh, God doesn't do that. We're in the New Testament. He's a grandfather in the sky. God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't. And I'm like, really? What's Ananias, Sapphira? Chapter 5 of Acts. That was the New Testament. That was after Jesus' resurrection. Do you think God cares how we view him? Yes, he does. He cares a lot. And if you don't have a right view of God, you're not going to worship him the way he deserves. He knows everything about you and me. Nothing is hidden. It's all laid bare. So quit trying to hide. Get it out. Get it right. I've had people say to me, man, if people knew what I've done, they, they wouldn't even look at me. I said, I think everybody could share some of those stories. I said, get it out in the light. Jesus says, get it out in the light. See it for what it is. Repent of it. Get rid of it. Be done with it. It only comes to kill you and destroy you and take your life. Some people actually think they have secret sins. No, you don't. He sees it. He knows it. There's nothing hidden in his sight. In that same passage in Revelation 20, it says the books of your life will be open and the book of life will be open. We have a library with your name on it in heaven. Isn't that exciting? Everything's written down. Nothing is hidden. Only good thing, it's more than a good thing. It's a great thing. It's an absolutely beautiful thing. It's the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Woo! You better get hot. You better get excited about that. Anybody happy about that besides me? Amen. Amen? It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So from the foundation of the world, God's been preparing a kingdom for those who call upon his name. He's preparing a place that goes beyond anything you can ever imagine or dream of. God is amazing. And he's preparing a place for you, and he's preparing a place for me. And my question this morning is, are you living for the king? He's coming. When he comes, he's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as the lion of Judah. He's coming with an iron scepter, and he's coming to judge. Make sure your sin is already judged in Christ, and that you're living for the king, and you won't fall under that judgment. You'll be this group. It says, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will say this. He will answer and say to them, truly I say to you to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Do you think it matters how you live? You're not getting saved by how you live, but it's the fruit of what has happened in you. If you've received all the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God, are you not going to give grace and mercy and forgiveness? If you don't, I'm saying you don't understand what you've been forgiven. James 2.10 tells us if you break one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole. We're sitting with a group of people in this room where we're all guilty. 
But if we're in Christ, we've been all forgiven. The blood of Christ is what redeems us. If you had a debt that was so big you couldn't pay it in a hundred lifetimes, and someone paid that debt off, would you not talk about it? Seriously. We couldn't pay our debt back in a million lifetimes, and Jesus paid it for you and for me. Shouldn't we talk about that? Shouldn't we be telling people about Jesus? I want to share a couple of scriptures. In Malachi chapter 3, listen to what it says. Verse 16 and following. It says this. This is powerful. One of my favorite scriptures in the world. But it says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. Ooh. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day that I prepare my own possession. That's the day we're talking about right now. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son and serves him. Listen to what it says here. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between those who between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Do you understand that Sheeps and the Goats passage is all about are you serving the king or not serving the king? All the parables we've been studying in the last few weeks are about are you living for Jesus? Are you ready? Are you faithful? And are you alert? Are you doing and are you about the master's business? Is Jesus the love of your life? Do you understand everything needs to flow through him? in your relationships, your work, your, your school, your, your homes, your neighborhoods, everything that we do is about Jesus' life in us. Listen to what it says in Matthew 10. Forty through 42. It says this. And this kind of answers some of the things that were going on, but it says, He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Listen to this. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, He shall not lose his reward. Do you understand what Jesus is talking about here? And and the idea of going to visit somebody in prison was people are being arrested for their faith. And they're being arrested for their faith, and the only way they get taken care of is somebody comes and takes care of them, feeds them, and so on. But when you go to a prisoner in the Roman world, you are also identifying with what that person believes. So do you understand why when you go to visit that person who's been thrown into prison for their faith, you no longer care about your own protection? You're trying to take care of a brother or a sister who's suffering. And you align yourself with them and you say, I belong to Jesus. And they mark you as someone dangerous. Do you know why Christianity isn't so dangerous in America, but it's getting dangerous? It's because if we start standing up and speaking about Jesus like we're supposed to, do you think you won't be persecuted? Do you think that people won't come against you? But let me tell you what happens when you do that. Jesus shows up in power and glory. Jesus shows up in ways that you're just dreaming about or you've read about or you've heard about. Jesus starts showing up in your life in that way. They fed the hungry. Think about Paul when he traveled through on his missionary places. People would take him into their home. They'll get that reward because they lined up with the truth, the gospel. But it's also talking about taking care of the poor. 
helping those in need, doing the things that Jesus did. What did Jesus do when he walked on the earth? He cleansed the leper. Do you understand the lepers and the blind and the lame and those who had paralysis and the deaf and all those were considered cursed by God? That's how they viewed them in their culture. So they didn't want anything to do with them and considered them unclean. Yet Jesus comes, and what does he do? First thing he does is he touches them. It always amazes me that he touched the leper first and then he healed the leper. He becomes unclean right in front of the Pharisees. And I I can just see it. This leper comes and falls before Jesus and and everybody's like, "Ah, a leper, unclean, unclean. And they're backing up and Jesus doesn't even flinch. And the leper cries out, Lord, if you're willing. He's so desperate, he didn't care anymore if he got stoned. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the first thing Jesus does is touches him. You know how many people need to be touched by God through us? Who are the lepers of our culture? Who are the ones that are considered outcasts, and cursed, and all those kind of things in our culture? But Jesus touched him, became unclean, so that the man became clean. Do you know he became unclean for you, so you could become clean for me, so I could become clean? That's why he died on a cross. And now we live in a church, and if we're not careful, we want to be separate in such a way that we no longer get unclean, don't want to touch that thing that's unclean. We've got to stay out of that. And God is calling us to be light in the darkness. He's calling us to go into places where we can shine the light of Christ and touch those who are unclean. Do you get that? That's what Jesus is talking about here. And the ones that didn't, I mean, the, the, the beauty here is, what does he say to them? He, he tells them that they're blessed that they're his. Come and enjoy what I've prepared before the foundation of the world. And then he talks to the ones who, what? The ones who didn't do that. You know, you can go to church your whole life. You can give your whole life. You can go to Sunday school. You can do all those things and you might not really know Jesus. Do you realize that? Do you understand that? The whole point of being a Christ follower, a Christian, is to become like Jesus, that's the whole work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Do you understand that in this crowd right here, right here, us, if we all began to live that way, we we could never find enough room to put all the people. You know why? Because people would realize we really believe what we're talking about. We're not just talking about religion anymore. We're not just talking about, oh, I believe in Jesus. We're not just talking about that. We're, we're treating people like their lives depend on knowing Jesus. And we begin to give ourselves away and begin to lay down our lives for people in such a way that they want to know this Jesus we're talking about. The ones that didn't do that, Jesus says, you know, be gone from me. And I, he calls them to listen to this, verse 41. He says, then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, listen to this, which has been prepared for the de- devil and his angels. So the, the lake of fire, the eternal fire, was never prepared for people. It was always prepared for the devil and his angels. Unfortunately, also those who won't put their faith in real trust and live for Jesus. Again, there's no such thing as punching your ticket, saying the prayer, and living your life however you want. That's evidence that you didn't get converted, that you didn't get born again. When you get born again, when you come, you come as you are, and you leave His. Now, I'm not talking about walking perfect. I'm not saying you won't make mistakes. You'll make all sorts of them, but may you do it for Jesus and run back to Him every time. Just keep running to Him. Keep going to Him. That's the whole point. I want to end with a passage in Mark. Chapter 8. And I think this is fascinating. It's talking a little bit about what I read just before I got into the sheep and the goats. But verse 34 says this. It says, And he summoned the crowd with his disciples. Did you hear that? He summoned the crowd with his disciples. So there's this mass of people. And he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I want to talk about that just for a second as we're coming into this. Do you understand what it means to deny yourself and pick up your cross? I think that's 
a struggle for us, understanding that. Denying ourselves is, it, my life isn't about me anymore, it's about glorifying the king. Do you understand? Every day I get up, I have to recognize that God has a plan for me, uh, and, and he has divine appointments for me, and Lord, I am yours. And I joyfully and completely surrender to your lordship over me. Spirit of God, come and make much of Jesus me. Help me to be the man of God you called me to be, because I have no chance by myself. And it goes on in here, it says, and to pick up your cross and follow him. Literally, picking up your cross simply means, do you understand that you're to take Jesus everywhere you go? The gospel, the good news, the hope of Christ. We hold the hope of the world. There's nothing greater than knowing Jesus Christ and being forgiven for your sins. There's no life outside of Christ. So if we would begin to work at our jobs, like I'm on a mission field everywhere I go. So you're on a mission field in your workplaces. You're on a mission field when you go into the grocery store. You're on a mission field at the gas station. Will that change the way we live if we begin to look at it like that? I think it does. I'm going to deliberately connect with these people. And it goes on in here. Listen to what it says. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Meaning... I want to go to heaven, but I want to live the way I want to live. I want to make my own decisions. Jesus says this, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. You can't live the way you lived and be in Christ. It goes on and it says this, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Did you hear that? Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Live for Jesus. Live all out for the king. I can't even fathom what will happen if we come out of here living that way and go out and be the church in the world that we live in. And then it goes on. It says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? spend your whole life scratching and trying to have all the things that you want and you get there and find out you missed out on the most important thing and it's called eternity <laughs> the rest of eternity you're going to be away from the presence of God there will be no love no light no peace we see a little bit of hell on earth don't we we've seen a lot of that lately So for what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed, listen to this, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Do you understand that, you know, John says it kind of in a nice way, the Apostle John in chapter 15 of the Gospel of John, but he talks about remain in the vine, Right? If you remain in the vine, you'll produce the fruit of the kingdom. I mean, if you remain in Christ, if you deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him, if you live for Jesus and you're trusting in Jesus, the fruit of his presence will be revealed in your life. You can't help it. And he says the Father is the gardener and he'll prune you so that you even produce more fruit. That pruning is what I call sanctification in the Christian Missionary Alliance. We call the work of God refining us, changing us, transforming us, making us more like his son. But it says in there, the, the branches that don't produce fruit are cut out and thrown into the fire. Isn't that what the sheep and the goats is really about? Are you producing the fruit of God's kingdom or are you just religious? Do you really live for Jesus? Now we're going to sing and we're going to praise the Lord and you can make your seat your altar. You can come to the altars. Do whatever God stirs you to do. But as we finish, listen folks, Jesus is coming. And he's coming back for a bride that's waiting and anticipating and excited about it. Are you that person? If you're not, do business with the Lord today and ask God to do work in your heart. And we're going to see some fantastic things in this church. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would just come and do the work that only you can do, Lord. Only you can capture a heart. Only you can transform a heart. Only you, Lord, can fill a person with the Spirit of God, the living God. 
And I just pray today that you would chase out of our lives all those things that are keeping us from being everything you've called us to be. Jesus, accomplish your purpose. Do your work. Lord, bring deep conviction where conviction is needed. Lord, don't let anybody be asleep in the light. Lord, bind the strong man from this place. Lord, move in us. Change us for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with us. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus this is my desire to honor you Lord with all my Lord with all I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. For you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may Jesus' love encompass you. May his passion for you draw you into his presence. May you know that your sins are forgiven. 
And may you walk in the freedom that Christ gives. And I pray in your name, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would make much of Jesus in all of us. Literally, that we couldn't help but talk about you. Go in his peace and his strength. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.